my name is Jennifer Thiessen. I am the Artistic Director of Virtuosi Concerts here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I am very pleased to be here with Madeline Hildebrandt, who is the Director of Virtuosi's Young Artist Program and also was the Interim Artistic Advisor for two years before I came on board. And we are here with the musicians who will be playing the next concert in Virtuosi's season, the final concert of the season, violinist Christina Bouy and pianist Pierre-André Doucette. And their concert is going to be soon. It's Mother's Day, May 8th in the afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Uh, this is my first time meeting Pierre-André and Christina, but I think Maddie and the both of you, you all know each other from before. Is that right? I have nice. uh, yeah. I've, I'm so glad that I was enjoyed it, uh, invited to join tonight because yes, I have met Christina and Pierre Andre years ago, and I wanted uh, Christina to reflect. Do you remember the first time we met each other? Oh yeah, we were. How could I forget? Surrounded by um, chamber music in the middle of the woods in Maine for two months, basically. <laughs> That's right, Knizel Hall, which was Knizel set. Hall. Yeah, which was such a, a a happy summer, two summers for me. How many years were you there, Christina? I did it for three years. And that's where you met members of your current quartet, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's a so, magical place. Yes, mm -hmm. very magical. And Pierre Andre, do you remember uh, where we first met? I do. I believe. I don't know what the restaurant is called, but I think it was oh. that restaurant off 18th Avenue in Brandon. In Brandon, and it was at the egg gray competition. At, at the egg gray competition, which, if you can believe it, was nine years ago. That's right. And um, I still remember your final round performance of um, Rodney Sherman's piece. It, it was something about Pluto and and Ceres or something. It was it was absolutely stunning. I remember being completely gobsmacked throughout your entire recital. Oh my gosh, that's that's very kind of you. Um, so oddly enough, the A grade competition piano round is actually starting tomorrow again. So that's every three years. Yeah, every three here, years. here we are. Yeah. So thanks for inviting me tonight. Uh, I'll pass it back to Jen. Yeah, I was wondering, both of you have very interesting artistic practices. You do much more than play violin and piano. I was wondering if each of you could tell us a little bit about all the different things that you do and how that sort of shapes the violin and piano playing that you are doing as well. Christina, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'm a classical violinist, um, but I grew um, up in a very musical family. So both my parents are singers and my sister went into musical theater and I grew up just doing a variety of styles. So I actually started on piano um, and I was quite serious about both instruments um, until I got to around age 14. Although let's be real, I kind of always knew that I loved violin <laughs> just a little bit more. I love the piano too, but I just mm -hmm. connected more with the violin. And so by age 14, I decided I wanted to have a life <laughs> and not <laughs> be practicing both like crazy. Um, and then, you know, I continued singing throughout and it was easy, I could study with my parents. And so now that's something that I also like to do besides the violin. And I, I think actually um, how it's influenced and shaped my, um, my violin career has been instrumental, um, pun not intended, but it was there. <laughs> But appreciate um, <laughs> the the singing aspect. Just it really relates to the sound that I'm able to get out of the violin. Um, just phrasing, um, and when people talk about longer lines, you know, all you have to do is just sing it, and it's there. So it's a great way of just living and practicing the music, and it's great to have the foundation of piano too, because it's great to have the understanding of what Pierre's playing and and it makes our partnership that much easier you know when we get together to rehearse I don't have to ask too many stupid questions 
I would, I would, Dad, I would, I would be as forward to say as I don't think you've ever asked a stupid question, but Aww, that's why I keep him around. <laughs> you know, just enough fluffing, and um, but I, I, I would say, yeah, our, our duo is quite special because of those other practices that we have. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trained as a classical pianist, um, uh, just as as Tina was, uh, but I've been very versatile in how I've expressed my pianism over the years. Um, so I've performed solo works, I've spent a lot of time working on contemporary music, um, I work as a chamber musician, I work especially as a vocal coach and as a, a vocal pianist. Um, so I think that's one of the one of the reasons that Tina and I connected so strongly the first time we played music together. Um, was because we instinctively thought of phrasing and, and structure um, on, on sort of the same wavelength, um, where, where breath sort of informed it, even when, as pianists and violinists, breath doesn't usually come into the equation, but we both sort of, from our other practices, have brought that into what we do, um, and it, it just sort of makes our music making so much more uh, instinctive and easy to to manage and to communicate about because we have that shorthand that we share. Um, and then my second artistic practice, let's say, is as a writer. Um, and so that draw that drew me to vocal piano, of course. But it it I think it informs who I am as a pianist um, because of things like structure, because of things like wordplay and and um, well, yeah, especially structure. Like I tend to think of things very narratively. I tend to think of things in terms of what is the the communicative goal of what we're getting at. Um, and so, you know, I draw a lot of parallels between musical language and and spoken or written language. And I think that's um, that's something that I, I appreciate in in having both practices. Hmm. And you're also an artistic director, is that right? You're involved. I in am. Uh, yeah. Yes, I've I've been uh, artistic director of uh, Barachois Summer Music alongside pianist Julien Leblanc uh, for the past ten years. Uh, this is our eleventh season this summer, mm -hmm. and uh, for the last year and a half, I've actually been um, interim executive director at the Fry Festival, which is a uh, bilingual literary festival in Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, that was sort of my my pandemic pivot uh, when I ended up here a few years ago. Um, and I've, I've grown a lot through that as well. Um, it's not all of it is immediately applicable uh, as, a, as a performer, um, but I've gained a lot of skills and um, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting insight into what um, people with real jobs lives are like. <laughs> So it's been a journey um, and actually the festival begins, we're taping this on uh, April 21st and the festival begins today um, and runs until May 1st. So I'm, I'm quite excited about that and, and to be seeing that. That's great. We'll have to throw uh, a pitch in for, for that festival uh, <laughs> on our Virtuosi page. And how did the two of you meet? Funny story. Um, well, we actually met at the um, national, the Canadian National Music Festival competition um, that summer. It was happening in Moncton. Do you remember the year? I think it was 2007. Oh, was it? Yeah, that's right. And, um, and I think you got third prize, right? I did. <laughs> and, and then I got second prize in the string category. And so it was like, Yes, we're dominating the the maritime <laughs> us maritime musicians representing right now. Um, so we just met kind of briefly there, but we didn't get a chance to really spend that much time together. Um, and then we both applied to Debut Atlantic separately, and they came to us and they said, "Oh, what do you think about um, touring? You know, together and and teaming up for this." So. I thought, sure, why not? I, I'm up here, you know, a while ago, but that could be fun. Um, and so I think you were pretty gung-ho too. I, I was, yeah. Um, yeah. It was a, 
we we really didn't know each other that well we were we were acquaintances at that point but i think we were both open yeah. to the possibility and and excited about the opportunity um and that tour in two and a half weeks we did 10 concert dates and 10 school outreach shows i think we drove 3000 kilometers uh, mm -hmm. and so we got to know each other quite well quite quickly um and in a good and way because we loved each other at the end of that tour and we were like okay if we can like each other this much still after touring together for that long and not annoying each other that's a really good pairing plus just <laughs> musically we really line up like we we really um just feel things the same way which is really beautiful because we don't even have to talk about a lot of things yeah um and so yeah so then after that we said okay let's apply to all these other things together and so yeah now we're stuck together that's great <laughs> do you mind sharing the very funny um uh alternative duo name i remember reading this on your facebook oh yeah. <laughs> like oh, do 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 boo debut boo oh <laughs> <laughs> We came up with a few, with a few hashtags during that tour. The Dubu hey. Dubu duo. Um, we do we do you boo. Uh, uh, you, or it's you do you boo because do do, do do set and then boo booey. So you do you boo. That's great. And then we went down a rabbit doing, hole very quickly. And then you started adding in the debut thing there. It was like a lot of boos, do's, and debuts. <laughs> I love it. We were heavy on the branding very yeah. early on. <laughs> and is there any repertoire that you were already playing then that you're still playing? Like, do you have sort of like signature pieces that have become your duo language? I would say there's a few. Um, we do play a lot of French repertoire together. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so one piece that was on our original tour uh, program with uh, Debut Atlantic and that we're still touring with for period debut is the fourth movement of Saint-Saëns Violence Not a Number One. Um, I didn't, I was not familiar with this piece before Tina, Tina was very adamant she wanted to program it mm -hmm. and I wasn't familiar with it and I went to listen to it and the first time my jaw just dropped and I, I, I think I flat out refused. I was like, no, there's no way I'm not doing this. <laughs> you kind of, yeah, you kind of did. And I was like, okay, we're doing it though. <laughs> Tina was like, no, no, but, but we're doing this. And I was like, eh, yeah, went, no, but we're doing it. Um, and then I did some slow rhythm work for eight months. Um, and the first rehearsal was still a disaster. And sort of by sheer grit and will, Tina was like, no, we're going to keep doing this until it works for both of us. And we did a bunch of school shows and I played it on a variety. Maddie, you probably have had similar experiences touring where you don't know what you're going to end up with as a piano. So I played on uh, 20 note keyboards and I played on pianos where um, six of the notes stuck um, and some of them had no double action. And um, you know, playing it on, on all of this variety of instruments uh, by the end of that tour, uh, now it's in the pocket. If you, you wake me up from a dead sleep and you're like, Tina wants to play because I don't play it with anyone else. Um, and she'll say, Tina wants to play this. And I'll be like, okay, you sit me down on the piano. It's memorized to the point where we recorded it during the first leg of this tour. Um, and uh, when we told the recording text, what our recording list was and how much time we had, they were like, are you sure? or we can do this in this amount of time and we were like yeah yeah and I think we did it in one take maybe mm -hmm. two. yeah we okay. did it one take yeah yeah that's incredible yeah and we, we also played the Debussy Sonata as well yes yeah which we're playing for you and it's it's so short for as far as sonatas go it's like a little mini tasting platter but it's so beautiful and luscious and I love it that's cool so you've got Saisons, WC, and what else is on the program? You have some modern works as well by some very cool composers. Yes, we had we commissioned um, a work by Nicole Lisey specifically for this tour, okay. um, who is 
she's like blowing up right now and becoming super famous. So I was like, wow, you wrote a piece for me. I'm quite honored. Um, and we just, we felt really strongly we wanted to have um, female representation on the program. Um, it's really cool. So at first when I was practicing it, I was getting all annoyed and frustrated because I couldn't make it sound the right way. So I was like, this is stupid, but it actually, it's really cool. I, one of the bows I use is made out of parchment paper. So it gets a super different kind of sound effect. Um, and yeah, I mean, we do a whole demonstration. So the audience oh, is cool. going to hear it, but it's, it's really, really neat. Um, another, we're doing two um, pieces by uh, the, by Cooper by Oh, and Lily Boulanger. Oh, and, and Kukara as well. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> we do two pieces by uh, s several composers. Um, so the two by Couperin, um are for harpsichord originally. Um, and Pierre, Andre, and I are absolutely obsessed with them. And I said, what if I arrange these for violin and piano? Because I really want to play it too. <laughs> so. He said, okay, so I did it. And actually they came out really nicely um, and we, we really enjoy playing them. So the audience gets to hear that as well. And yeah, as you, you can tell the whole, you're, you have a whole spiel about Lily Boulanger. I won't do the whole spiel, I'll leave it for the concert, <laughs> but we play two pieces by Lily Boulanger for, for violin and piano that are absolutely stunning. Um, she was a French composer from the from the Belle Epoque, pretty much a contemporary of Debussy, actually. Um, and uh, her music is absolutely stunning. And there's so little of it because she uh, she was 25 or 26 when she passed away, I think. Um, but absolutely stunning pieces. Uh, so we're very happy to include those on the program as well. Um, mm -hmm. we, we Tina and I, when we set out. Uh, this program was called Creme de la Creme, um, and it features like highlights of, of, of great French composers. Um, but we were very committed to making sure that um, female voices were represented within that program, because so often when we do see a program of the great French composers or the great Russian composers, you get the same three or four dead white men from 100 years ago. Um, and we don't really look further than that. And sure, there's great music there, but there's so much wonderful music that that exists beyond those paradigms. Um, and I think it's our jobs as performers to make sure that we keep making room for um, for those voices on our programs, uh, because otherwise we're just becoming, you know, uh, the repertoire just becomes a facsimile of itself year after year. Um, so we're very committed to that work. And that's why we're very happy to have uh, contemporary works on our program, um, as well as works by by women composers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you do. It's such a just, I mean, your program was booked before I joined Virtuosi. So when I came in, I was like, oh, who's coming? And just looking at what you guys are playing, like, it's just like, thank you so much. Like, it's so beautiful and encouraging to see this amazing music that people are programming and and sort of shining a light on you know all this all this time later or you know the the stuff that's new and being commissioned and mm -hmm. uh do you also have works by jesse montgomery are those on the program yes okay we have um we have one piece by her called peace i did it again another anyways <laughs> And she's a violinist um, as well, right? She is. Okay. And actually, she's a friend of mine. Oh, okay. um, but also, she's just absolutely amazing. She she was actually in a string quartet as well, which is how I met her. We met at um, a string quartet seminar. And then she quickly realized that composition was really important to her and she just wanted to do that full time. So she left her string quartet, but she was a very serious violinist before that. Um, and she's just having her works commissioned all over now, like by the Chicago Symphony, the New York Philharmonic. I mean, she's doing great things. And um, her music is, this is a little different from how she usually writes. It's, she wrote this piece um, about 
um, her mother passing away during COVID-19. Um, and it wasn't due to COVID-19, but just um, all the emotions and everything that she went through during that time. And so she notated it down um, in this in this beautiful piece of music that the audience will get to hear. So it's really touching um, just to just to know that connection yeah. with it. And it's very relevant to our time and what everybody's going through right now. That's amazing. I can't wait to hear the program. Thank you so much for we're, taking We're time. so excited to come. Cool. Yeah, Have you been to Winnipeg before? To come. Sorry? Have yeah. you been to Winnipeg before? Okay. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, my grandfather was born in Winnipeg and I think grew up there for a little bit. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're particularly excited to uh, to come to Winnipeg um, for this leg of the Prairie debut tour since it was postponed yes. um, from January. And before that, it had also been postponed three times. Um, so we're very, very excited to finally be coming and sharing this program um, with your audience because we've been wanting to do so for quite a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are we couldn't be more thrilled that it's happening and that you're coming. Um, I, I have, oh, sorry. I was just no, going to go say, ahead. I have um, a really special instrument that I'm bringing as well um, that people might be intrigued by. So I'm right now I'm playing um, the 1728 um, Archo Stradivarius on loan from the Juilliard School. Um, so it's your chance to hear a Stradivarius live and up close <laughs> in person. But we're gonna market that. Yeah, yeah, you should. <laughs> yes, you should. I didn't really, um, like. I knew a Strad was a Strad, but I didn't really know until we toured with it in January uh, how rare they are. Tina was saying there's mm -hmm. what 250 of them in the world right now. It's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is truly a treat, and mm. Tina on any instrument is sensational to hear. But having Aww. her play that instrument. Every day, I, I paid him to say that. <laughs> I get paid well. Uh, <laughs> nice. No, but have, having heard her mm -hmm. every day on that particular instrument, there's there's uh, a really wonderful tone and sonority to the instrument that is uh, something out of this world. So it's definitely worth um, um, coming and having a listen. That is really exciting. Um, for everyone listening come to the concert, hear the Strad, hear all the beautiful music. It is on Mother's Day, we didn't mention that. That's actually really fitting considering Jesse Montgomery's piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's Sunday, May 8th, 2.30 p.m. at St. Andrew's United Church in River Heights. For tickets and all information, you can get that all on our website, virtuosiconcerts.ca. And as always now, we have $10 tickets for students at the door. So just show up 20 minutes before the show and you can get in for 10 bucks. So thank you all so much. I can't wait to see you soon. And it's been great to talk to you.